Welcome to the Tenpetal Lectures on Robotics, Basic and Advanced Concepts. In this lecture, we'll look at control of a single link. So, what do we have at this point? We know what is the desired trajectory of the single link. We know what is theta d of t, and this has been generated in a smooth and continuous manner using a C2 trajectory and using cubic uh, polynomials. The goal of control is to make the joint follow the desired trajectory accurately. So we'll see what we mean by follow and accurately a little later. More importantly, it should follow the desired trajectory in spite of external disturbances and internal parameter changes. Okay, and again, we'll see what is external disturbances and internal parameter change. So the goal of control is to minimize the error between the desired and actual or measured motion. Okay, and this requires that we use some feedback. So we need to measure the actual motion and then by using some feedback and then this feedback requires use of sensors to measure the actual motion. Okay, and we also need to use a control scheme. So we will look at linear control scheme in this lecture because it is very well known, it is very well studied and more importantly it is also a basis for advanced nonlinear control schemes. So let's continue. So we have a link which is link shown here. It is driven by a DC motor. Okay. The typical rated speed of a DC motor is like maybe 2000 RPM. Okay. However, 2000 RPM is too fast. Typical speeds which are required is like 60 RPM. Okay. Or let's say one radian, one rotation per second. Okay, so one rotation is like 2 pi radians per second. Okay, and if you have a link which is about 1 meter long, so 2 pi is about 6, let's say, so we will get 6 meters per second, which is still very fast. So we need something like not more than 60 RPM, and hence we need a large speed reduction. We will assume that this motor is connected to the link by means of a with through a gearbox which achieves this large speed reduction. So we have a gear ratio which will be of, of course much much less than one but in this figure I am showing only two spur gears. Okay, We are not doing gear design however we know that if you want a large speed reduction maybe you need multi-stage gearbox but for the purpose of this course or this uh, lecture we will assume that it is the speed is reduced using one set of spur gears. So N1 is one of the gears which is connected to the motor and N2 is the number of teeth in the output gear which is connected to the link. Now when we connect a motor to the link, we also need to assume some friction and the inertia of the motor shaft. So this is given by Fm and Jm. So Fm is the friction in the motor shaft. Likewise, we will assume that the inertia of the output is JL and the friction is FL in the load shaft. So we assume that the motor is providing a torque TM and it is the variable which is a rotation of the motor is denoted by theta M. Likewise, the rotation of the link is denoted by theta L but we can also have some external torque which is acting on this link which is given by TL, okay, denoted by TL. So these are all the parameters that we need to analyze the motion of a single link actuated by a DC motor. So the link rotation theta L is related to the motor rotation theta M by theta L by N which is N. So this is the speed reduction. This is what is happening at the gearbox. Okay. So n is much, much less than 1. We have a 1 degree of freedom system. So basically, theta L is n times theta m, theta L dot is n times theta m dot, theta L double dot is n theta m double dot. Okay, so there is only one variable. 
and we will we will for the rest of this lecture we'll assume theta m is the independent variable so the equation of motion of gear 1 which is basically the motor plus the gear 1 can be written as jm into theta m double dot plus the friction which is happening at the motor shaft plus some reaction torque from the gear 2 to the gear 1 okay so plus t1 this should be equal to the torque which the motor is generating okay this is straightforward from free body diagram the equation of link plus gear 2 can be written as jl into theta l double dot this is like i alpha plus fl into theta l dot so this is the loss due to friction okay there is an external tl which is acting and also there is a torque which is coming from gear 1 to gear 2 okay so this is the t2 is the torque transmitted to gear 2 by gear 1 again this is straightforward free body diagram very simple equations of motion linear if you assume that there is no energy loss at the gear tooths then t1 into theta m should be equal to t2 into theta l right so the work done by t1 which is t1 into theta m is t2 into theta l the equation of motion for the system which means what I would like to write everything in terms of theta m and its derivatives, the input torque from the motor which is Tm and the external torque which is acting on the link. Okay, So if you play around with all those equations, if you eliminate theta l and theta l dot and theta l double dot and t1 and t2, you will end up with this equation jm plus n square jl into theta m double dot plus fm into n square fl into theta m dot is equal to the motor torque tm plus n into the torque which is acting on the link. Okay, So what are some of the observations? One is as I said n is small. So let's say n is 0 0.01. So which means that n square is very very small. Okay, It is 10 to the power minus 4. So what is happening because of the gearbox the effect of the load inertia and the load friction as seen from the motor is reduced by a factor of n square. Okay, So the motor basically does not see the load inertia and the friction on the load side. The effect of TL this external torque which is acting on the link is also reduced by a factor n. Okay, So multi-link robots with gear reduction at the joints in, the, in those, the effect of coupling torques from one link to the other, due to the motion of one link, there is a coupling torque which acts on the previous link. Okay, We can sort of think of that as TL and that is reduced. Okay, So this is one of the reasons why linear control schemes work in industrial robots, because this is the linear equation. Okay, Only problem case is this NTL, okay, where TL is the coupling torque of some other link acting on the link that which you are trying to control. But the effect is reduced by this factor n. Okay, and if n is small, okay, our life is made easier. We can use linear control. Let's continue. We also need a model of the motor. So in a motor, basically we apply some voltage Va, then there is a output shaft which is rotating by theta m dot. Okay, The typical DC servo motors contain a stationary coil okay, which is the stator and the rotor is a permanent magnet. Okay, So through the coil which has a resistance Ra and inductance La, the current flows Ia okay, and it goes to the motor and then because of Faraday's law, the rotor will start rotating. So typically the stationary armature okay, of resistance L and uh, so resistance and inductance RA and LA we have to include. The rotor is a permanent magnet. Okay, Nowadays we get very good permanent magnet motors. 
with very rare earth materials and the voltage VA is applied and the coil carries a current IA. Okay, so this has all the elements which go into modeling of a DC servo motor. The torque which is generated by the motor can be written in terms of the current which is flowing through the coil, stationary coil. And Tm is given by Kt times Ia. So Kt is called the torque constant. When the coil, when the uh, rotor starts rotating, a back Em is generated okay, by the motor at in the coil and that is given by V is equal to kg times theta m dot. Okay, so this this is called as the back EMF constant kg and if you go and buy any motor they will tell you what is the torque constant and what is the back EMF constant. The dynamics of a motor can be written in terms of a first order differential equation which is LA into IA dot plus RA into IA plus kg into theta m dot is equal to VA. So this is basically the drop of voltage in the inductance which is LA times IA dot plus the drop across the resistor and the drop due to the back EMF must be equal to the applied voltage. Okay, This is some standard law in motors, Okay, electric circuits. For small DC servo motor, LA is small okay, and hence can be ignored. So what, do I, what are we left with? RA into IA plus kg into theta m dot is equal to the applied voltage VA. So now we can solve for IA from the previous equation which is VA minus kg m theta m dot divided by RA. If you multiply by kt, we will get the torque and hence Tn plus NTL is given by that previous left hand side. Okay, We are not changing anything in the left hand side. So in a compact form, we can write the second order differential equation as a first order differential equation which is J omega dot plus F omega is equal to K into VA plus TD. Okay, So you can see K is KT by RA. F is Fm plus n square Fl plus Kt Kg divided by Ra. So the resistance in the armature or resistance in the coil is like a friction term. Okay, It adds to the friction. The inertia is Jm plus n square Jl and the disturbance type or the type which is acting externally on the link is n times Tl and omega is denotes theta m dot. So omega is the speed. This equation describes the mechatronic behavior of the single link manipulator. Okay, what, what is the word mechatronic means? It defines the mechanical part, which is the inertia and the friction and so on. And it also includes the electrical part, which is the voltage applied and the resistance in the coil and so on. Okay, so the dynamics of this system is basically in terms of angular velocity. It's a linear first order ODE. You can see J is constant, F is constant, K is constant. Okay, so it's a linear first order ODE. The back EMF increases the damping of the system. So KT minus KG theta M dot, KG by RA causes more friction. Now from this equation, we can see that this link will rotate, means what? It will achieve some omega. Okay, If either you apply a voltage or you apply a disturbance torque. So you can think of this as like a fan blade okay, of your ceiling fan. If you apply the voltage, the blade will rotate. Or if there is no current flowing through the fan, but if you hit it with some stick, the, again the blade will rotate. So, that is what we mean by there are two possible inputs. One is the voltage and one is the external disturbance. So how do we analyze these systems? The simplest is to use Laplace transform and this is available in any undergraduate mathematics textbook. So I am just giving you some of the very basic notions in Laplace transform. First thing is if you are given a function in time, uh, f of t, 
the Laplace transform of f of t is 0 to infinity e to the power minus st ft dt. Okay, and this is given by f of s. The derivative of f of t, and if you want to find the Laplace of the derivative, then this is given by s into fs minus f of 0. So this is the initial at t equals 0. For 0 initial conditions, we can convert an ODE to a polynomial in s. Okay. So for example, omega dot can be written as s omega s. So js into omega s plus f omega s is equal to k v a s and t d s. Okay. Remember, we have assumed initial conditions are zero. So in Laplace, the differential equation j omega dot plus f omega equals k v a plus t d is written as j s omega s plus f omega s equals k v a s and t d s. Okay. So this is straightforward Laplace transform. Now what do we do with this expression? which is obtained after taking the Laplace transform. So we can define something called as a transfer function. And what is a transfer function? It is the ratio of the output to input in Laplace domain. So as I said, we can have two inputs, VAS and TDS, okay, the applied voltage or the external disturbance. And the output is clearly the speed, omega S. So we can have two transfer functions. One is omega s by V A of s, which is k divided by j s plus f. Or we can also write omega s divided by T D s is 1 divided by j s plus f. Okay. And we can show these transfer functions using block diagram. Okay. So this is a block which says k divided by j s plus f. Input is V A s, output is omega s. Similarly, we can have TDS as the input and the output as omega s and the block is 1 divided by JS plus f. We can combine these two because this is a linear system. So we can have input as voltage and TD also as one more input and then we can sum these two and get omega s and the trans block is K divided by JS plus f. So these are basically nothing but the transfer functions. So these three a and B, so A means two of one block here, one block here, and this block here. These are called open loop transfer functions. Okay, so as opposed to something called as a closed loop transfer function, in which case what happens is you take this omega s, you measure using a sensor, and you feed it back. So there is a desired omega ds, there is a measured omega s. So, and you subtract, so this plus and minus sign means you subtract and you find the difference between omega d and omega and you pass it through a controller and then you feed it back into this. So, something like this where there is a loop, where there is a feedback, this is called as a closed loop system. Okay. So, as I said, figures A and B are called open loop transfer function or open loop systems. Figure C is called closed loop can be used to obtain the closed loop transfer function. Okay, here the motor output is measured and fed back as another input to controller. Okay, feedback, the robustness to internal parameter changes and external disturbance. Recall, I said we need to use feedback. So what happens in feedback? We get something called robustness. Okay, and that is shown by some simple argument next. So let's assume that this voltage which you are applying is given by Kp into omega d minus omega s. Okay, so this block here, which I call the controller d of s, the simplest possible thing in this block is a constant Kp. Okay, so at this place we have omega d minus omega. Why? Because the sensor has transfer function unity which is not a very serious assumption. Okay, We can see later that this can be easily handled. But in this block, we put one single constant, which is Kp. So the output of this block is Kp into omega d minus omega.
okay so voltage applied is kp in, into omega d minus omega or the transfer function of this d of s is kp a constant now let's assume that this controller gain kp can be chosen to whatever you want but once chosen it is fixed it's like some kind of a factory setting okay you can do whatever trial and error whatever experiments you want but once you have done all the experiments you freeze it so let's go back to this previous thing also if you don't have feedback okay so then there is some voltage which is coming in with feedback there is this omega d minus omega part okay so with open loop i can choose kp as 1 over k0 okay or k0 is k by f let's make a choice of that so then with td equal to 0 okay what is the steady state steady state is when s tends to 0 so what is the output omega s as s tends to 0 we have to find the limit s tends to 0 k divided by js plus f into va of s voltage applied and what is the voltage applied that is nothing but kp into omega d there is no feedback coming back okay so we have omega is equal to k by f into va okay and this is equal to k0 kp into omega d but we have chosen kp as 1 over k0 see this is a choice we have made kp as 1 over k0 so if you make that choice then you can see that the output omega is exactly equal to omega d okay so this is what we want we want the output to be the same as what we the desired omega in case of closed loop we have chosen the output voltage after the controller as kp into omega d minus omega previously it was va of s which is kp into omega d okay so now we can find the output as s tends to 0 s tends to 0 means st steady state t tends to infinity we can compute limit s tends to 0 the transfer function with the feedback can be obtained to be k, k into kp js plus f plus k into kp into v of s so omega will be k0 kp into 1 plus k0 kp into omega d okay so in steady state the output omega is related to the desired omega by this term k0 kp into 1 plus k0 kp so what is the best thing that we can do we choose k0 kp much greater than 1 so let's say we choose k0 kp as 100 so what do we have we have 100 divided by 101 so omega is approximately equal to omega d so it looks like with feedback the situation is worse so without feedback omega what was exactly equal to omega d whereas with feedback omega is approximately equal to omega d okay so why should we do feedback so now let's look at this whole idea of robustness which is let's consider the change in internal parameter due to some environmental change okay so this motor was designed and we chose and you did all the experiments in bangalore in a cold place and then we took it to a desert which is a much hotter place okay so then this internal parameter which is k0 what is k0 it contains the resistance it contains the friction and various other things changes from k0 to k0 plus delta k0 okay so for open loop in steady state we will have a change in omega which is omega plus delta omega and we can show that this gives this leads to k0 plus delta k0 into kp into omega d okay this is what we will get since kp is set to 1 by k0 this change in output delta omega will be delta k0 by k0 into omega d okay so if k0 changes by 5% the output will also change by 5% however when k0 kp is greater than 1 in closed loop system we have chosen k0 kp much much greater than 1 
So then you can show that the delta omega prime by omega prime is given by 1 plus k0 kp into delta k0 by k0. Okay, where delta where omega prime is k0 kp 1 plus k0 kp into omega d, which is approximately equal to omega d. So hence, an x percent change in k0 leads to 1 over 1 plus k0 kp into x percent change in omega prime. Remember, k0 kp was much greater than 1. So the example which I gave you was k0 kp equals 100. So you have 1 by 101 into x percent. Okay. So what is happening? The change in output is greatly reduced by feedback. So this is what we mean by robustness. So I am going to follow the trajectory, desired trajectory of omega d in spite of changes in the internal parameters. We also said that you should be able to follow the desired trajectory in spite of changes in the external disturbance. So if Td is not zero, Td is the term which represents the external disturbance, then we have omega is equal to k0 kc into omega d plus k0 into Td by k. Okay, the controller again, for the moment we call it as kc. So for k0 kc equal to one, Okay, we'll have omega equals omega d plus k0 into td, td by k. So this is for open loop. So in open loop, remember k0 was 1 over kp or kp was 1 over k0. So if you do the same thing here, what happens is that change in output is proportional to td. So whatever is happening to td, you will see some omega output. With feedback, the output is given by k0 kc divided by 1 plus k0 kc into omega d and plus k0 into 1 plus k0 kc into td by k. So if you choose k0 kc greater than 1 and k0 kc greater than k0 by k or basically kc much much greater than 1 over k then the effect of TD is reduced. Okay, so basically again, this is much smaller. So TD will be multiplied by a small number. So what have we showed? We have showed that if you use feedback and if you choose proper controller gains, which is the gain or the block diagram D of S, whatever goes into D of S, we can reduce the effect of internal parameter change, which is K0, and also the effect of TD. Okay, let's continue with the analysis of the first order system. So for the moment, we will assume that there is no TD. Okay, so what we have, we have a plant, which is the model of the motor, which is K divided by JS plus F. There's a voltage, which is the input, and the speed of the link which is the output and we are going to measure the speed omega s feed it back using a sensor so at this place we have omega d minus omega s and at this place we have the difference between omega d minus omega s which we multiply by kp and that becomes the voltage which you apply to the plant okay so the closed loop transfer function between omega s and omega d can be derived and you can show that omega s by omega d is k into kp by j into 1 over s plus bracket f plus k kp divided by j. Okay, so this is the first order system. So those of you who know Laplace transforms, you can see that there is only one s plus something term below. Okay, so Omega output by omega d input is given by some constant into 1 over s plus something like a. Okay, this whole thing is a constant. So there are several possible inputs which you can give. So one of the standard 
inputs which control theory people use is what is called as a step input. So basically at t less than 0, it is 0. At t equal to 0 and t greater than 0, it is 1 unit. Okay, so this is the unit step which is applied at t equals 0. So what do we want to find out? If you apply such a step input, what is the output? Okay, so the plot of the output will look like this, omega of t, and we can find out exactly what is the equation for this curve by taking inverse Laplace transform. So omega t is of the form 1 minus e to the power minus f plus kkp by j into t. Okay, so f, k, kp and j are all positive. So it is like e to the power minus some positive quantity into t. So as t tends to infinity, okay, this term will go to 0 and we will, omega t will approach 1. Okay, so what are some of the things that you can quickly see? That the system is stable, meaning what? I have given a bounded input, which is omega desired is equal to 1, and the output is also bounded. The output doesn't go to infinity. The other important thing is that this e to the power minus something term into t, okay, if kp were to be increased, so for example, if kp is 1, I will get e to the power something. But if kp is, let's say, 100, I'm just picking uh, one small and one large number. So e to the power minus 100 or something of the order into t, what will happen? This curve will rise much, much steeply and it will reach this one much faster. Okay? Because, so if this is like e to the power minus t or e to the power minus 10t. So e to the power minus 10t will reach, uh, so this curve will reach one much faster. Okay? e to the power minus 10t will go to zero much faster than e to the power minus t. So what is the model of the story? If I change this controller gain kp, I can make this output curve look different. I can reach one faster or slower. Let's now continue. We look at a second order system. So for the control of angular rotation, the open loop transfer function with td equal to 0 is given by theta s divided by v of s is k into s into j s plus f. Okay, why did we get this? Because s into theta s is basically omega, so omega by v is k divided by j s plus f as derived. But now I want to write it as a problem of controlling the angular rotation not the angular speed. So the transfer function in this case is a second order system because why? We have s into js plus f. So there is a s square term in the denominator. The closed loop transfer function between theta s and the desired input theta d of s. Now we have not omega d but theta d and you can derive the transfer function as k kp divided by s into js plus f plus k into kp, okay? So this can be written in a generic form, which is omega n square plus s square plus 2 psi omega ns plus omega n square, okay? So where omega n square is k kp by j, f by j is 2 psi omega n, and psi is f divided by 2 into square root of j k into kp, okay? So for Second order system, omega n is called the natural frequency of the system and psi is called the damping. This is the standard form of any second order system. So we have omega n square in the numerator, some omega n square in the denominator and one damping term, 2 psi omega n into s. So both psi and omega n completely describe the behavior of a second order system. It also comes from vibration. Those of you who have done a course in vibration, we see there's something called natural frequency and damping. Okay, the same idea is borrowed in control theory. So there are three possible kinds of behavior. One is zero, psi, less than one. These are called underdamped systems. Okay, 
In an underdamped system, the output oscillates about the desired input before settling down in infinite time. It will oscillate and slowly come down, but it takes infinite time to reach the output. The settling time, Ts, is defined as the time taken for the output to reach within plus minus 5% or plus minus 2% of the input. Okay. So for plus minus 5%, Ts is approximately equal to 3 divided by psi omega n and is 4 divided by psi omega n for plus minus 2%. So if you want to reach within a band of 2%, you have to wait longer. The maximum overshoot is large for low damping and small for high damping. Okay, the peak overshoot is given by e to the power minus psi divided by 1 minus psi square pi. Okay, the ratio of the denominator closed loop polynomials are complex with negative real path. Okay, meaning what? If I were to find the roots of this denominator polynomial, s squared plus 2 psi omega n s plus omega n square, and psi lies between 0 and 1, the roots are complex conjugate, okay, with negative real parts. So the roots are in the left half of the s plane. Okay, what is the s plane? The x axis is the real and y axis is the imaginary. So this is called as the s plane and the roots of this denominator polynomial are in the left half S of the S plane. Okay, what is the output? I will show you what the output looks like in a figure next, uh, in the next after two slides. So if psi is equal to one, these are called critically damped system. The output will show no oscillations, but can cross the input at most one depending on what is the initial velocity. Okay, the settling time can be defined similar to the underdamped case. In this case, the roots of the polynomial, denominated polynomial, are real and repeated. Okay, and lie in the left half of the S plane. And the output of omega t for a step input is again I will show you in the next slide. If psi is greater than one, these are called overdamped system. So in this case, the output can never cross the input and is the sum of two exponential functions. Okay, The roots are real of the denominated polynomial and if you take Laplace transform, you will get e to the power some at plus e to the power some bt. Okay, But both a and b are the negative or they lie in the left half plane. So in this figure, I show the typical response for underdamped, critically damped and overdamped system. Okay, so the first plot here shows if psi is 0 0.25, theta d in all these three cases is a unit step input. So the output will look like this. And as you can see, it will oscillate about the theta d equals to 1 and eventually after a long time settle down. If psi is equal to 1, the curve looks like this. So there are no oscillations and it will reach this omega theta equal to 1 after infinite time. Likewise, if psi is overdamped, which is greater than 1, then the curve looks like this. So the overdamped plot is always lower than the critically damped. Okay, so these numerical plots were generated by assuming k equals j equals f equals 1. Okay, so we can very easily solve this differential equation in MATLAB. Okay, and plot theta of t versus time for different values of k, j, f, and kp. For one link manipulator, omega and psi depends on the controller gain kp. Okay, so omega n square is k kp by j, and psi is f divided by 2 square root of j k into kp, as mentioned earlier. So if I choose kp, I will get a omega n, but psi is automatically fixed. Okay, so changing kp changes both omega n and psi. Okay, nevertheless, by changing kp, 
I can change the output. I can make it under damped, I can make it critically damped, or I can make it over damped by choosing KP. Okay, the simplest possible controller is this proportional controller where we choose this gain KP. If you want to choose omega n and psi arbitrarily, okay, see here, if you choose KP, omega n is automatically determined. If you choose here KP, both psi and omega is automatically determined. If I want independent omega n and psi, I cannot do it with a proportional controller. I need something called as a proportional plus derivative controller. Okay, the proportional plus derivative controller transfer function looks like this. Strictly is not correct, but nevertheless, we'll, let's proceed. So we have Kp plus Kb into S, where now Kp is the proportional gain and Kb is the derivative gain. The closed loop transfer function can be again obtained. We'll get theta S divided by theta d of s, but now in the numerator we have kkp plus s into kkv. The denominator is j s square plus s into f plus kkv and kkp. So what you can see here is this is like omega n square and this is like 2 psi omega n. So I can choose kp which will more or less determine omega n and then I can choose kv and I can get different psi. Okay. So conceptually, we can get arbitrary omega n and psi by choosing k, p, and k, v. Okay. So if you want to increase k, v, that decreases overshoot, but T, s becomes larger. Okay. So damping decreases the overshoot, okay. but it will take much longer to reach your desired output. For critical damping, Kv is 2 times square root of Kp. Okay, so to obtain desired performance, we need to play around with this transfer function, Kp and Kv, and we can we need to use a computer okay, as a tool. And there are many, many software packages which have been developed over time where you can play around with this Kp, Kv, and we'll see later another gain called integral gain such that we get the output in the desired time and in a desired manner. Okay, to decrease steady state error, okay, I have not defined what is steady state error. Steady state error is basically the fact that you can never ever reach the omega or theta d t equals to 1 in a real system. There will be always be an offset. Okay, and this comes from things like backlash, friction, and stiction at the joint. We cannot reduce steady state error without what is called as an integral term. An integral term can be used to reduce the steady state error. The integral term is Ki divided by S, where Ki is called the controller gain. And we need to choose this very carefully because when you add a ki by s into this transfer function, it becomes a third order transfer function. Okay, and third order transfer function can be unstable. So if you choose a large ki, then the whole system can be unstable. So even though the system itself, the plant itself is stable, but if you add an integral gain, it can cause instability. As I said, this SKV is not really a correct way to implement a derivative part. Why? Because there is something called as a system to be causal. So if you want a system to be causal, the numerator polynomial degree must be less than or equal to the denominator polynomial degree. So in this case, the numerator polynomial is SKV. The denominator is constant. So that is not allowed in control theory. However, we can easily modify it and write kv times s divided by 1 plus tv times s. So now the numerator polynomial is 1, denominator polynomial is 1, and this is perfectly allowed. Okay, so we choose tv okay, as a time constant. So tv is another choice that we have. So <coughs> this kb times s into 1 plus tvs is a, basically represents a filter. So 
the transfer function of the controller is kp plus ki by s plus kv into s into 1 plus tvs and we get to play around or choose kp ki kv and tv okay so we need to go to a computer tool play around with this for a given system such that we get the desired output in the correct in the desired time in time domain this transfer function can be written as this voltage applied is kp times e of t plus kv times e dot of t and ki times integral of e tau t tau okay so we have the output of the controller is proportional to the error proportional to the derivative of the error and proportional to the integral of the error so this is why it is called pid control p stands for proportional i for integral d for derivative okay it in robotics and some other applications also we often add a feed forward term okay so it is it can be shown that this addition of a feed forward term which is theta d double dot improves trajectory tracking okay so the modified pid controller which is used in most robots is that voltage applied or voltage supplied to the motor is is equal to some theta d double dot proportional to theta d double dot plus this pid term okay sometimes there is a constant which multiplies this theta d double dot so in that case we have one more parameter to play with which is maybe you can call it as ka which is the acceleration uh, gain let's continue most modern controllers use digital microprocessors okay so we use digital control and what is the difference that is it is not a continuous time control it is a discrete time control and discrete time control important concept is sampling okay so for example if theta d were to be this solid curve actually we can never achieve this solid curve in a digital control we have to discretize this solid curve into steps so one step like this one for a short time then another step then another step and then another step so what the motor will see is an input for a short while then another input then another input and so on okay so discrete jumps in inputs theta d of t so what is the difference between these two jump in this case it is t of s this is called as the sampling type and in the y direction in theta d this is determined by the how much discretization you are doing okay so as i said the desired input theta d and the output theta t are not continuous only the dashed lines are available okay so analog to digital conversion so basically instead of this nice analog signal we get this digital thing is done electronically typically this sampling time ts is between 1 and 10 milliseconds okay and typically in the y direction uh, one unit is divided either by 8 or 12 bit and a to d conversion is used so 1 volt if it is 8 bit is divided into by 2 to the power 8 which is 256 intervals okay or if it is a better a to d converter we are using suppose there are 12 bits so 1 volt is discretized into 2 to the power 12 small steps okay so if you have larger a to d conversion okay the difference between this dashed lines and this solid line is much closer okay so we need ideally a uh, 12 or even 14 bit a to d converter okay but they are more expensive so it depends on the choice that you have to make so a digital controller looks like this so we have this same plant which is k divided by s into js plus f this is the motor with the link there is a disturbance stop which is coming 1 by k then there is a voltage which is coming from the controller okay so which is v a of t we measured the output theta of t by a sensor if 
this measurement is analog, we have to do A to D because everything inside this dotted block is done in a digital computer. Okay, this side theta of T and this voltage which is coming in is analog. Okay, it's a smooth continuous uh, signal. So if you have a sensor which is analog, we have to convert it into A to D. So let's assume that we get theta at every sample time, which is K into TS. We also have theta D of T, which is coming from motion planning. Remember we discussed how to plan the desired trajectory in a smooth and continuous manner. But then we cannot use that smooth and continuous theta D of T. We have to sample it. So we now have theta D at every time, at every sample, so K of T of S. So first K equals to one at one sample, K equals to two at the second sample and so on. The subtraction of these two gives the error, okay? This error is fed into this controller. We'll see what this D of Z means and output is a voltage. So here also this voltage is discrete. Okay, but we cannot give discrete voltages to the motor. So we have to convert it back to analog, D to A. Okay, this digital is converted back to analog. And we have this very important block called zeroth order hold. So what this does is when there is, so between two discrete values of voltage, what is the value that you need to give to the motor? Okay, so that is that you ho hold the previous value. Okay, so it is in some sense, whatever is the previous till the next sample happens, we hold the previous value. Okay, and finally, this voltage which is obtained after the zeroth order hold is the correct voltage, but the current is very small. Okay, so maybe in milliampers. You cannot drive a motor in milliampers with the correct voltage. So what we need to do is we need to amplify the signal. So we get the correct voltage and the correct current. Okay, and in an amplifier, we can have saturation. So what it, what it is showing here is that it is linear for a while, but then it can saturate. You cannot keep on amplifying till whatever uh, uh, amplification you want. Okay, so as I said, theta D, KTS and theta KTS are the kth desired and measured theta. The error at the kth instant is theta D KTS minus theta D KTS, and this is computed as a digital value. So the error is input to a controller D of Z. Okay, output is a discretized voltage. So D instead of D of S, which was in using Laplace, we use what is called as the Z transform. Okay, and so that is why it is called D of Z. So the discretized voltage is converted to analog in a D2A converter and using a zeroth order hold. So the D2A and the ZOH introduces a delay. This is the source of many complications because it will take some time for it to do this D2A. Okay. Finally, as I said, the output of the microprocessor is in milliampers. We need needs to be amplified to drive the motor. Okay. So the controller, what is in DZ, this is what is called as Z transform. Okay, we are not going to go into details of this digital control using Z transform, but a typical D of Z from this book, Franklin, is given by KP plus Ki into Ts divided by one minus z to the power minus one, Kv into something else. So as you can see, the sampling time gets into the picture. Tv, which was there originally, that is also there. And then you have Kp, but it is not divided by s. It is one minus z to the power minus one. So it is not Ki divided by s. So the integral term is one Ki divided by one minus z to the power minus one into T of s. Okay, so not only the sampling is taken into account, but we have a different form. Okay, so this is also a very well studied topic, which we will not go into. This is called digital control using Z transforms. So in summary, 
we have a model of a single link driven by a DC servo motor. I showed you that feedback control diminishes the effect of internal parameter change and external disturbance. Then we discuss the analysis of control of single link. Okay, it's a linear system and we can do it in S domain, in Laplace domain. I showed you how we can look as a first order system and also as a second order system. As a first order system, we were doing speed control. As a second order system, we are doing position control. Proportional controller is the simplest and the simplest possible control scheme. We can either change the natural frequency or the damping when you are looking at as a second order system. We cannot do both. If you have proportional plus derivative control scheme, also called PD control scheme, we can change both the natural frequency and damping. Okay. And finally, we have this PID control scheme, which is very, very popular. And the I part can be used to reduce steady state error. Okay. And finally, all these control schemes are typically implemented using digital microprocessor. And we don't have the analysis done using S domain, but we have to use the Z, transfer, Z transforms. Okay. So with this, we'll come to end of this lecture. Thank you. In the next lecture, we'll look at the control of a multi-link serial manipulator.